Hello. All right. Hello and welcome to Sage Advice. It's been a long time since we recorded one of these, but I am Greg Tito and I'm joined by Jeremy Crawford. And we are here to talk about fun little bits within the rules of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which Jeremy, being lead rules developer, can expound on uh, very much so. And we're going to today talk on a topic beginning combat in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Uh, covering what it's like when two combatants mm, encounter each other, when a surprise occurs, how does the first round uh, initiative-wise, or when to call for initiative, all of those things. Uh, so, so Jeremy, when, when do you begin combat? I begin combat when people start fighting. Now, that sounds super simple, but we're having this talk because often you'll have in a group that vague moment of, like, is it now? Did the fight start now? Here's a great example. Yeah. First, the, the obvious kind. You have the group of adventurers. They see down the hallway the group of goblins. The DM says roll initiative. Easy. Yeah. But then it gets trickier. The characters are at a masquerade ball. They've just spent, uh, thanks to the players being enthusiastic and in character, schmoozing it up with the NPCs for... 15, 30, maybe even 45 minutes of real time, people using funny voices, and someone suddenly says they pull out their dagger and stab somebody. Uh, Those are always the trickier moments. And you see this in some live games. This has even happened in uh, recent uh, Acquisitions Incorporated episodes that I've DM'd, Mm -hmm. where you'll have this role-playing scene that will suddenly, because of a choice somebody made, transition into violence. And the question is often for some groups, how do you manage that transition? Because it's not as smooth as, again, we open the door, there's a gelatinous cube fight. Although usually with a gelatinous cube, you discover it's there uh, from the inside because you had just accidentally walked right into it. It's a horrible example, but no, <laughs> I, I get what you're saying because you want to uh, f- figure out a way to transition in a way that feels natural but doesn't uh, mess up with the way the rules are set up. Exactly. So one of the things that will often throw people is that if you play the game sort of by the book, even if, all right, we're at the masquerade ball and I suddenly realize this person who I thought was the Duke, I just now figured out is actually a devil impersonating the Duke. Out pull, I pull my, my blessed dagger and stab them. Now, running with the narrative and being excited as a player, I immediately want to grab my d20 and make an attack roll and deal damage. But the whole system assumes that the instant the narrative transitions to violence, that everything suddenly pauses. It's almost like if you're watching a movie, and I've even described this as a DM before, Mm. it suddenly slows down. You know, you think of the the old, uh, uh, the first Matrix film when they came up with that technique called bullet time, where suddenly you see the bullets tracing through. As soon as that dagger comes out, players, in a way, you can kind of train your own expectations about what should happen next. If you get into the mindset of us, when you tell the DM, I pulled my dagger out to stab, you're signaling intent, but you've not yet stabbed because the instant you intend to engage in any kind of battle, initiative needs to happen because suddenly everyone else needs a chance Uh, to act, to respond, to get out of town, uh, to do whatever it is they want to do. And there are so many things in the game that really rely on that bell being rung of it's initiative time. Yeah, and I think if you you ignore that, and you can as a DM, of course, if it feels justified, but if you ignore the call for initiative when that violence begins, you're ignoring a large part of you know, uh, having a high dexterity or having, you know, class features that improve your initiative, uh, 
you know, be, the impact of that or having a, the monsters improved initiative be a factor in what that's happening. And so I, I really like your analogy of like the, the, the drawing of the dagger or the pullback of about to stab is actually the inciting thing because then everybody gets a chance to potentially react. It's almost and it is like a it, it's a pause moment where it's like, OK, who is going to be able the first one to act? Right. In this situation. Now, many players will sometimes say, but I'm the one who started it. Shouldn't I get to strike first? Right. Not necessarily. You were certainly the one who pulled out your weapon. But someone else in that scene might actually have faster reflexes than you do. They might, out of the corner of their eye, see that knife going back and they might cast a spell before you actually strike. Uh, that's a part of the fun uncertainty of the game. Right. That's one of the reasons why we roll initiative. We roll it not just to have a moment of sort of almost like bookkeeping at the start of combat. It's actually to inject this exciting bit of uncertainty that no matter how many battles you've been through in D&D, &D, you never know. Are you going to go before them? Are you going to go after? Are you going to be right in the middle of the pack? And where you are in that order can significantly impact not only what you do, but how the entire fight unfolds. And that's why it's important to not try to jump over that step. And so even though you were the one who incited, you had the inciting action that triggered combat, just remember, you're signaling intent. You're not actually stabbing them yet. Yeah. Um, now, the game has a mechanism in place to represent if you truly took everybody off guard. If you did, if nobody saw this coming, that's where surprise comes in. Surprise, partly because of how it has worked in previous edition, uh, editions of the game, sometimes can get a little sort of mixed up for some groups. You'll, one, one sign of this sometimes for me is when I hear people referring to a surprise round. Mm. Uh, because in, in previous editions of the game, not every one, but uh, in some editions, there has been this thing called a surprise round that sort of existed outside the regular process of combat. In fifth edition, there is no surprise round. There's just combat. Combat starts, you roll initiative, and then if an individual is surprised, if they had no idea combat was about to start, you know, it's like, I thought we were just getting muffins at the bakery. And, you know, <laughs> suddenly your giant mall is in your hands Gosh, and it is coming How many times has that come to happen to me <laughs> here in Seattle? Like at least five. When you're really hangry. I'm really hangry and then I get bonked in the back of the yeah. head. Yeah. You're, you're like, oh, I just wanted that <laughs> almond croissant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you really didn't see it coming, you were so fixated on that almond croissant uh, <laughs> that and suddenly combat has started. Well, then the way for the DM to show that uh, the attacker is going to get a, the jump on me because I would be the almond croissant guy. Like, oh, I love him. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting a lot of almonds. Yes. Uh, really, yeah, this is a personal example for you. I yes, guess this is it. This is, this, is the way to get, this is the way to get the drop on me in combat. Let's <laughs> put out almond croissants. <laughs> yes. uh, look for me in Bakery bait. Nouveau as I, look, as I choose uh, oh, almond God. croissants. I love the, the macaroons there. They're so good. <laughs> Um, clearly, we want treats. I know, right? It's, it, maybe it's just it's tea time right yeah, now. We need yeah. to get some uh, some high tea uh, pastries in here. That's right. <laughs> so, if I'm the surprised guy, uh, what that means is in that first round of combat, I don't get to do anything. Uh, I, on my turn, I even still get a turn. That sometimes also is a point of confusion for mm. people. That oh, if you're surprised, you don't even get a turn. No, you actually still get a turn. You just don't do anything on it. Uh, you, <laughs> well, what's the distinction there? Why is that important? It's important because there are a number of effects in the game that have durations keyed to the start or end of somebody's turn. Oh, I see. And so for, for the durations in the game, you still need to have a turn. Even if you're just sitting there slack-jawed, just, just drooling wanting, over the almonds. <laughs> yes, just wanting that treat. <laughs> and that weapon is coming soaring at you. You still get a turn as you get to contemplate possibly the end of your life instead of the <laughs> yummy breakfast you're about to have. So that means no actions can be taken, no movement can be done, no bonus actions or reactions, correct? Exactly. Uh, the surprise rule in the player's handbook, it, it specifies you can't move, 
and you can't take any actions. And keep in mind, everybody, if you can't take an action, it means you can't take a bonus action. It's uh, important. That's a part of the bonus action rule. And then you also, as you rightly said, you can't take any reaction up until the end of your turn. Oh, okay. Essentially, you can think about it as like you get to the end of your turn and it's suddenly like, woo, something, something's going on. <laughs> Combat's happening. <laughs> Combat is happening. So if, if it's ever important to try to trace when do you stop being surprised, it's the end of your turn. Got it. Your end, the end of your turn where you did nothing. <laughs> and now as soon as that turn ends, you could then take a reaction uh, in response to something if you have one uh, to take. Many people don't, uh, but some uh, classes or subclasses have special reactions that might suddenly be relevant. There are some spells uh, that might be relevant. Uh, but like, if you're a surprised wizard and someone attacks you before your turn, you can't cast shield even if you've got it prepared yeah. because until the end of that first turn, you can't use your reaction. But that's also why it's important to not ignore the initiative roll because say you still are surprised, you, you're still rolling, you still may be higher up in the order and not able to take an action, but that means that everyone, every combatant after that who's attacking you, you would be able to take a reaction and cast shield. Exactly. And that... And, and thank you. You're for, I'm getting better at this yes, you're, <laughs> from talking for, to you so many times. For, for really, you're pointing out why it's important to follow these sequences because so many things in the game assume the sequence is being followed. Yeah. Uh, and at first it might seem like, ah, eh, we don't have to worry about it. And of course a DM adjudicating, uh, as long as they're keeping an eye on you know, things being fun and moving at a, at a nice pace, a DM of course can fudge things but my recommendation is as much as possible, follow this at least to start so that you begin to see how all the pieces fit together. Something else that comes up is people will wonder, can part of a group of characters, can some of the members of a group be surprised and other members of the group uh, not be surprised? Do you know the answer to this one? I'm going to say yes. Yes, that is correct. Yes. A, a, Sides in a battle are not necessarily all surprised together. Mm. Uh, and that's another reason why it's important to not get lulled into this idea of there being some kind of surprise round that affects entire groups of people. Individuals are surprised, not groups. So, uh, you know, me, guy who wants breakfast, I might be surprised, but the rest of my party who were maybe standing at the door to the cafe and were actually vigilant, they might not be surprised. Yeah. And so during that first round, I might be the only person who doesn't get to act or move. And an easy way to uh, also incorporate perception and roles in that, like if you have a lower passive perception, but your rest of your party has a higher passive perception, they won't be surprised uh, whereas you would still have that uh, almond in your in your in your in your eyes. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and that one of the things I I like to do as a DM is often try to find ways to make players feel good about the choices they made when making their character. Yeah. So if I have a character in the group who is heavily invested in their perceptiveness, I will often do things where their passive perception gets to shine. Uh, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll set a, a sort of a DC and everyone with a passive perception, uh, you know, high enough, they noticed what was about to happen. They heard that very faint twig snap right before the ambush, but then the rest of the party didn't. It's a small thing, but it, it A, can lend some excitement because, uh-oh, we yeah. got surprised. But then it also lets those players feel good about the investment they made in their character, which that connects to sort of like a little DM tip I'll throw in. And that is DMs, make sure you have actually read your players' character sheets. Mm. Uh, not because you need to police how they run their character. Uh, I, I tend to have a pretty light touch as a DM in how players run their characters. But I like to read their character sheets to make sure I'm building in as many hooks as possible 
to make the players, again, feel great about the character they're playing. Yeah. Uh, because in this co-op game, even though I do like to you know, have the players sometimes on the edge of their seat and they might be scared for their character's welfare, I want them to have a good time and to feel like any time they've invested in detailing their character uh, was not a waste. And there's nothing that's more frustrating as a player, too, where you're like, hey, I've created this entire concept of my character around stealth and surprise, but my DM will never let me have any surprise. Like, right. what the, you know, it just, it, there's something just really uh, off putting about that, that dichotomy. And so, like, when someone as a DM is interested in me, like, all right, I need to, you know, maybe you don't do it every time, but you got to throw that player situations that they have the chance to succeed in the way that they want to. Absolutely. Uh, but that goes back to another, uh, your earlier example of being in a hallway and a group of uh, adventurers seeing goblins. How would you uh, begin to initiate that comment, say, if the, co- the, the goblins you know, are, are unaware of the party being there? And, and how would that begin? So if one group manages to surprise every single person in the other group, then really you just get to go to town for an entire round. I mean, your group, uh, you all get to take your turns while the other side spends their turn um, really wishing they had been paying more attention. <laughs> it's like, how how did every single one of us get surprised? I I will usually only have that happen if the players really have done a fun job of describing the ambush that they're that they're unleashing i tend not to give away like total surprise just on accident uh because typically what i'll do is i'll have you know i'll compare um passive perception uh, to the stealth if if one side was being stealthy If it's just sort of like a random thing that happened, like I just decide on a whim, there's a group of goblins down the hallway that I hadn't planned on being there, and maybe some of them are paying attention and maybe some of them aren't, I might decide uh, to let the the dice determine how many of them were paying attention. So like, let's say there are six goblins, behind the DM screen I might grab a D6, roll it, and let it tell me how many goblins were actually paying attention. I see, so make it a little bit more of a, you know, not one side or the other type thing, but still up to chance. Because I think unless the group has specifically laid an ambush, it really feels sort of just like, I think, kind of a cheap giveaway to like, and now you all get a free round of attacking. Like, that might be fun the first time it happens, but it starts feeling sort of like a slaughter. Whereas if you were clever and, you know, you laid this ambush, you you figured out how to get the drop of them. I love to reward that. Um, but I don't, I don't like to just sort of randomly, and now everyone just sits there as you carve into them <laughs> with your weapons. I mean, it just sort of, there's something gruesome about that. I mean, granted, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of combat in D&D. But again, it, I, like, I like so often to show how one choice leads to uh, one outcome and another choice leads to another outcome hmm. because one of the beautiful flexibilities we have with D&D is showing uh, consequence of showing that player choice really matters in a way that isn't possible in any other game. Uh, in a tabletop game with you know a, a game master you know, nudging things along in response to the choices the players make, you can give them a sense of influence in the world that is really uh, remarkable. And, and so a part of that is I like to not have too much that just feels sort of disconnected. And then if I do want something random to happen, I make it truly random. And that's when I let the dice decide. That makes sense. And I especially, if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to let the dice decide, I often like letting the players roll the dice. Uh, you know, if if so, they control their own fate. Yes, and also so that they can see, we are all in this together. When we're looking at that die as it clatters on the table, in finding out what's going to happen next, because they are seeing. Not even the DM knows. You know, if I, you know, sometimes I might decide. All right, you know, the the orc chieftain hurls a javelin at 
one of you, yeah, you know, one, two, three, four, roll a D4 to find out who he throws it at. They'll know, okay, I didn't target any of them. The, yeah. You know, chance decided uh, who was getting targeted. And then it always ends up being the one that has the least hit points <laughs> and <laughs> is also the healer. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and then you're like, oh, God. I, I've done that a few times recently where I'm like, oh, well, the dice said you're dead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's deal with the consequences of that. Yeah. Um, now, yeah, so, oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, going all the way back to that initial example of the person at the masquerade ball who pulls out their dagger, and they are the ones who who took sort of the inciting action. Yeah. Because of how swingy the D20 is, they could end up going dead donkey last in the initiative order. I've seen it happen before, where the person who triggered the battle acts last. I like that you said dead donkey. I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what that means, but dead donkey last is, yep. is entering my lexicon. <laughs> uh, it, I, <laughs> it, it feels right, doesn't it? It does. It feels right. Yes. Uh, so everyone just know any time the D20 is in the mix, that is a swingy die. Get ready for the unexpected. And even with uh, you know a plus six to your initiative, it's still, you, yeah. And what I encourage groups, players and DMs alike, to do is rather than viewing that as uh, something to chafe against or be unhappy about, embrace it as a storytelling opportunity. Over, over the years, the longer I play D&D and DM D&D, the more I have come to love the unpredictability of the D20. Because so often it will create moments that will challenge the DM and the players to really stretch their storytelling ability to come up with a fun reason for why this transpired. Why did the ace rogue who triggered this battle, why did she end up going last? And so I, have, I as DM, when I've been confronted by that chain of events, have come up with sometimes just outlandish things going on in the scene that suddenly distracted the person who initiated the entire fight that have then sometimes, as, a, as so often happens in D&D, kind of caused this chain reaction of storytelling where half a session might then uh, unfold based on that 1d20 role where we, you know, in our effort to come up with a justification for it, bonker stuff then happened and we all had a better time for it so uh, to sum that up i would just say to groups you know when the d20 throws you a curveball catch it and follow through with the curve like to just see where it leads you yeah uh, and rather than like oh this is dumb or this isn't you know how it should have played out no in D D, when the d20 does that it's really showing no this is how it's going to play out and let's ride it. Let's see wh where this craziness goes. And it doesn't mean the game is broken or not rewarding. It, you know, like he here, this is this is the game. This is trying to figure out how failures and successes get narrated. Right. So, you know, I'm I'm someone who learns by examples, uh, and I'm sure many of our listeners are too. Uh, in this masquerade example, say the crack rogue pulls out their dagger, they roll a one on their initiative, and is going last. What would be a couple of things that you could say is the reason why that they're going last? They might have been standing near the buffet table <laughs> and <laughs> seeing an almond pastry. <laughs> <laughs> and the pile of almond pastries might have been stacked so high that right as they pulled out their dagger, their elbow hit that pile of pastries and it came toppling over them. And so they spend most of that first round shaking off <laughs> almond croissants. Yeah. I mean, just the. The kinds of things you can come up with, uh, you know, I w my recommendation is DM, do what I just did, and that is imagine the environment and use the environment as a tool. Use the NPCs as a tool. Yeah. Uh, I, I think in that way, you know, that might... Uh I've totally done that. Like, made oh, you you buffed something, you baffled something, so that's why you're going last. Um, but as a rogue, you'd be like, well, I don't know, I'm a really good combat. I think I would know that I was going to bump into that. So you might do it something that's beyond their control, like an NPC being like, oh, hey, Bob, remember, yep. let's go talk. And you're kind of like waiting for your moment to make that first stab while you're you're in that social interaction or whatever. Or you, or right as you pull out the knife, the person next to you, not the devil in disguise. 
Uh, but one of the other people at the masquerade ball pulls off their mask and you realize it's your Aunt Gladys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a little horrified to yeah. see you pulling out this knife. Ooh. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, right. Like making it and, and using the environment as a it's a social party that's going on. So let's have it be a social reason as to why that is happening. Exactly. I like that a lot. Yeah. And, and preferably something that will be fun. Right. Uh, to to me, the the weird things that the D20 can often trigger uh, are often at their best if if they are weird, if the DM leans into the strangeness, uh, into the unexpected. Uh, because part of also uh, what that die does for us is it reminds us in our storytelling of a factor in real life is that None of us know what weird things are going to happen to us on any day of our life. We all have plans. We all have intentions. Uh, but any of our days on this planet, rarely do they play out exactly the way we planned. Uh, I mean, I think we could all agree that the day where every single thing goes as planned it's usually pretty remarkable. Uh, right. You know, anytime I've had one of those days where, you know, it's it's often been on vacation or on, on a weekend where it's like, all right, we're going to do this and then we're going to go here to eat and then we're going to do that. And then if the day plays out exactly as you thought, it's like, whoa. Whoa. Uh, but even then, there were probably small unexpected things that might have occurred. Yes. And that's why I think, you know, movies like Groundhog Day or something like where people are caught in a loop that can feel uh, like a sort of hell yes. that's not real, that feels like you're in something that is um, you know, punishing you because it's so alien to what our normal experience is. Exactly, because our normal experience is, I can intend for this to happen, but chances are something unexpected is going to happen and I'm gonna need to adjust. Yeah. And D&D is always asking us to adjust. Uh, and not just players, the DM too. The DM is, is in on this fun ride, uh, especially if the DM embraces it, to roll with the unexpected that that the dice produce. Uh, and so just always always remember players, uh, and even DMs, because I've even seen DMs kind of over signal, all right, this is gonna happen. Uh, you know, he, he brings down his, his great maul and you know, shatters you over the skull. Oh, oh, wait, I need to roll my D20, natural one. Oh, I guess I didn't do that. It's right. like, always remember when you're describing things, when you're signaling what's going to happen, not to get too far ahead of yourself. It's like you can say, all right, I'm the first part of what you're doing, then roll the die, then describe the rest. I have totally done bull, all three versions of that where I've ex done the thing. He's going to smash you in the face and like roll. I'm like, what? no, he actually does not need to do that. And you back <laughs> it up a little bit. Or done the like the first half narration and then roll the die and then narrate what happens after that. Uh, or just make it up whole cloth after you see the, the, the success or the failure. But um, I like the ability to... Uh, uh, you know, even if you're like, oh, he's going to smash you in the face, but then like retcon out a little bit like, all right, that was his intention. <laughs> Everyone in saw what was about to occur. But here's what really happened. The mall dropped on his foot and he, he took 1d6 damage. And even there, as you're narrating with just a slight tweak, your description about face smashing <laughs> would have been perfect. Because if you'd simply said he swings at your face, roll, and then we find out if he actually met your face yeah uh you, and you can see the intention you're like this is what the, you can see this is what he's tr the, the the combatant is trying to do and then you get to see the result exactly you can also wait to describe things until you roll the die i often like to do a little bit in advance partly actually to set myself up to be surprised mm. you know again i'll signal sort of what maybe the monster intends to do but then we'll find out what actually happens and uh, is that you're really getting at a nugget of something because that it's that unexpected part of the game that makes it fun for every single person at the table. Exactly. Uh, I, I as a DM, would never want to sit down and just predetermine how things are going to play out uh, because I love sitting there or standing uh, and just finding out along with the players what's going to happen next. Yeah. Because uh, none of us know if we really embrace all of those strange twists and turns uh, that the dice introduce. And it's that unexpected nature that gets the most reaction too, especially if you're like, here, I'm going to narrate up to this point, and then you roll the die, and, and you're like, 
and it's a one, and everyone will get their, oh, I guess that, and, and you'll get, oh, it's almost like a joke. It's like the setup and then a joke because everyone doesn't know what to expect, and then if there's something that happens, you get the result, and then you get the immediate reaction of everyone at the table. Exactly. And that's D&D to a T. So yeah. don't ignore that. Use initiative in order to enhance the unexpected nature of combat, but that's of your game in general. And I love how you just said that because looping back to something I said earlier, initiative isn't just bookkeeping at the start of combat. Yeah. It can be a narrative tool. And any time the dice are rolled, not just for attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws, uh, but also for highly specialized rolls like initiative, which is, I mean, technically it is a dexterity check. Uh, it's always a chance to narrate. And not just... One, two, three, you know, this is the order that this battle is going to go in. Now, something else I want to talk about real quick about the start of combat. Yeah. And this, again, has to do with trying to keep in mind that in D&D often you can express your what you hope is going to happen, but it's only usually when you roll that die, unless the DM just says, oh, the thing happens. It's only when the die is rolled uh, or when a certain gate is stepped through in the rules that you'll know for sure what's going to happen. And so the bit I'm thinking of is people often want to ready actions before combat is even started. The ready action is an action you take in combat, full stop. Uh, so there really is no such thing as readying before combat has started. Mm. Now, when even though I know that, I will rarely tell a player who says, okay, you know, all right, I'm creeping down the hallway and I, I ready to fire at somebody who, you know, comes into view. Even though I know they're thinking of the ready action in the combat rules, I rarely correct them. What I take that as is their version of signaling to me their intent that they are alert. And so usually then what that means is they won't be surprised at my table. And so even though I will not have the mechanics of the ready action play out, I will still reward them for thinking in advance and also, again, for signaling intent. And that is an important bit of being a DM. Players will often say things in a rulesy way. <laughs> that are not the actual rules. That are not the actual rule. I recommend to DMs don't get hung up on that because... Often, our job as dungeon masters is to discern intent, and then we will let the group know when it's relevant which rule to use. It's one reason, one of the reasons why that approach is one of the reasons why I actually find it super easy to teach D&D to people who've never played it before. I actually find it easier to teach people how to play D&D than most board games, because after I tell them what the different dice are, so they'll know what I mean when I say roll a d4, I really just tell them on your turn, describe what your character does, and I'll tell you what rule or what bit of your character sheet is relevant. That's usually all people really need to know to get going. Yeah. And then most of the rest of the rules you can actually describe as you go along. As long as a DM, you are committed to doing your best to understand the player's intent and take that intent and match it up with the appropriate rule uh, and then, again, let the dice uh, determine where things go. And it's because I have that perspective that even though, and because it, it happens a few times a year, especially if I run convention games, it, mm -hmm. won't, it will not be combat and someone will talk about readying an action. Unless they press, I will almost never say anything about it and just incorporate that into my decision making about what's going on and honor the intent uh, that they express right. It means that they're expecting an attack and at the at the ready for whatever is going to come. It doesn't mean that they're going to, uh, you know, uh, get away with that free attack. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now, people might be wondering, well, why not let people ready outside combat? A DM could certainly allow that. The reason why we didn't design the game with that being one of the core assumptions is. Quite honestly, we don't want that level of mechanical detail outside combat. Uh, the ready rule has a lot of uh, conditions in it, uh, not conditions like being grappled or prone. What I mean is, you know, things in order for it to occur. Exactly. And 
there's, there's quite a bit of specificity in that rule. We generally don't want that amount of specificity to be weighing upon the narrative, except for those times when it really matters and time has slowed down and slowed down so much that you're playing, you know, in six second increments, which is, you know, what's going on in combat. At that point where, you know, things are heightened and, you know, it's a life or death situation. OK, then those sorts of details uh, are great and the game is built to care about them at that point. But when you are really narrating exploration and social interaction and might just have a few die rolls here or there, we generally try not to have kind of the full weight of the rules gorilla, you know, beating its chest in the scene. We want the scene to just move uh, and for the DM to hear your intent and then match that to a rule. Uh, and now I have an image of you as a gorilla just <laughs> showing up at every single game where people are, are trying to argue about rules. You're like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm like, the, I'd be like the Kool-Aid guy breaking <laughs> through the wall. Yeah. But, it, but, but in gorilla form, but with my glasses on. And then you say, follow your bliss, man. <laughs> yes, exactly. Always follow your bliss. <laughs> and, and, and I mean that uh, for the whole table. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I sometimes will see people, they'll... They'll hear one of us talk about, you know, the DM is the final adjudicator. And it's like, but what about the players? And again, it's a co-op game. It's about everyone yeah. having a good time and about us matching our different forms of fun up with each other. Uh, it's about listening to each other, uh, using the game in a way that pleases as many people at the table as possible. And that is never shown as at the beginning of combat. Like, what's the topic of this <laughs> same advice? Uh, <laughs> just to bring it all back to uh, to what they, yeah. So uh, uh, I, I, I feel like I know a lot more about how to, to kind of, as I've been dungeon mastering a lot more, uh, uh, how to get that going. So thank you for, for expounding. Um, if people wanted to get in touch with you about more uh, ways to uh, <laughs> follow their bliss, <laughs> how could they do that? Uh, I am uh, reachable on Twitter at Jeremy E. Crawford. Excellent. We have to get you in more often and do more uh, uh, sage advice. I always, uh, it's always a joy uh, to, to talk through all these things with I, you. I always love being here. Uh, thanks a lot. We'll, we'll, we'll come back with more soon. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone who has been watching us on Twitch. Uh, I know we could probably, you know, continue talking about that topic and many others for for hours and hours. Uh, we could probably just take a player's handbook flip to a random page and just pick things on the page to talk about. We really could. That's actually not a bad idea. That sounds I, like some actually fun. We, we should do that for a few Sage Advice segments. I, could, yeah. I should just bring in some of our books. We could even we could even have Pelham roll a die to determine which book we open up. Yeah. Maybe roll a, a, some more dice to determine and what page we go to. Do a, uh, let's talk about this rule and what it was like and why we developed it and how it took you know this long. Yeah. yeah. That'd be a lot of fun. I, I enjoy all that and I think, uh, you know, the way that you always bring, you know, very specific guidelines about how to use rules back to the overall um, philosophy behind the game. Uh, I don't know. I always find that really enlightening. Good. And we get to talk about treats. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I'm going to have some almonds uh, croissants in here. Is there a Bakery Nouveau in your neighborhood? There is. Oh, okay. So, so I was like, did he go to West Seattle to get that? I used to have to, but not anymore. There's one on Capitol Hill, but I have to pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, other, <laughs> uh, otherwise, I would be in there all the time. I know. The, uh, the macaroons they have, the <sighs> rotating flavors the earl gray one has been my favorite for it's a long time delicious it is so good the green tea one is also oh, super I've, yummy yeah, i've had that as well my girls like the birthday cake ones uh, of course mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah but um it is it is always uh that hanging temptation if we go to get uh, uh some food in the junction of like oh we're gonna go to bakery nouveau and they're like all right i guess we kind of have to yeah if if you haven't tried it and you're ever around there for lunch their pizza is delicious really yes Huh. A few times when I've worked at home because the Bakery Nouveau on Capitol Hill is just a few blocks away from my house. Oh, perfect. I've walked up there to get their pizza and ooh, is so it, good. Is it like French bread pizza or is it actual it's a, pizza? Yeah, thicker crust. Wow. Because um, you know, it's a bakery. So Yeah. yeah. Gosh, I, lo I love just walking to that place. It, it feels uh, like an old-timey 
you know, French bakery. It really does. Yeah. Oh. But again, um, I, I, I have to make myself disbelieve it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, it's an illusion. Yes. Uh, that's been there the whole time. Uh -huh. I like that. Um, I'm excited about getting, and maybe we should do some more illusion uh, uh, discussions. I think we've, we've talked about it mm -hmm. at least once. Um, but uh, my character for Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus is going to be a bard uh, who uses illusion magic as uh, his backup band as well as visual effects. Perfect. Uh, you know, use it, he's going to have a wand as his attack, but uh, using the wand as uh, the microphone to... <laughs> <laughs> I almost want to take thaumaturgy, uh, even though it's not yeah. in the class list, just so that that's, you know, how he has the booming voice going out. This... This character is making me think of Job from Arrested Development. <laughs> so you, you're going to have like copper pieces shooting out of your <laughs> sleeves. So. Well, we won't go full Jim Dark Magic uh, with yeah. with uh, pigeons, but I was I was thinking more of the, uh, you know, David Bowie, David Lee Roth kind of, you know, late seventies, early eighties glam rock uh, as a character. I feel fabulous. Uh, who would want to do anything for for fame? Feels like something that the devils of uh, the nine hells would be able to take advantage of. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love making a rock star. I don't know this that idea of a of a fantasy themed rock star should be fun. Who might have to learn some humility, if if he hopes to escape hell. Yeah, or or he's just going to go full full evil. <laughs> 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 well, either or, right? I feel like the, you know the, mu the the that that story's been told, right? Like the selling your your soul to the devil in order to get musical talent and fame. I feel like I'll I'll, I'll play a version of that. All right. Yeah. I, I look forward to hearing how it plays out. Yeah. We'll see if the DM is up to the challenge. <laughs> uh, all, all I know is that I want to just be able to sing like, you know, Space Oddity or something like that uh, uh, badly <laughs> for my players. Wow. I, I, I almost think there should now be a karaoke component to this campaign. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I, so I've been, you know, singing some of those songs and with wands and in preparation for how it, the, he would uh, move. Um, but then I'm like, oh, but this is clearly a science fiction based song and so i've been playing with the idea of, of not only doing karaoke but like ma mashing up classic rock music into something that's more on theme for the forgotten realms oh boy yeah right. next thing we're gonna find out you have an you have a dnd album <laughs> <laughs> that's, that they, you will announce it has dropped right here on this show that's right yeah <laughs> you can you can hear it uh i will be performing it live here on twitch.tv <laughs> Slash D and D, uh, and it'll be terrible. <laughs> oh, oh, I will be there for it. Nice. All right. Well, maybe you'll be uh, part of the part of the band. <laughs> well, thank you everybody who has been uh, watching us uh, for this Dragon Talk recording. Um, we have Bin Win plays Idol Champions coming up at 3 p.m. So stick around and watch that. We will be back doing some more fun stuff next week uh, here from the D and D office. But we have a lot going on on the schedule all weekend long, uh, including uh, Rivals of Waterdeep at 10 a.m. Pacific time on Sunday, and uh, I will be at a panel uh, at TwitchCon. So that'll be a lot of fun talking about community. You can watch that at 2:30 uh, p.m. Pacific time on Sunday. There's a lot more of this stuff going on, so check uh, our Wizards underscore DND Twitter account for the latest schedule. And uh, you know, once again, I want to thank everybody for, for being here and being a part of this. You're all good people, except for those of you who are chaotic, evil rock stars from Baldur's Gate. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend.